Hello friends, today is the 18th Sunday in Ordinary Time, Year B. Our readings in today's liturgy take up again the theme of bread. Last week, the readings focused on the multiplication of loaves of bread used to feed different groups of people. This week, the liturgy narrows down on what earthly and heavenly bread entail. In the first reading, taken from Exodus chapter 16 verses 2 through 4 and 12 through 15, the people of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. Upon their complaint, God sent them manna from heaven. Manna in itself is a word which expresses the mystery surrounding its provenance and its lack of an adequate definition. The Responsorial Psalm, Psalm 78, a historical psalm retells the story of the first reading, but now it calls manna the food of angels, Psalm 78 verse 25, because it came down from heaven. St. Paul in the second reading, Ephesians 4, 17, 20 to 24, metaphorically speaks of the old and new way of life, which can be likened to the earthly and heavenly way of life which the believer must embrace. The former way of life is corrupted by deceitful desires, just as the bread, which does not give life, will always end in corruption and decay. In the Gospel passage, still from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 6, Jesus warns those who enjoy the miracle of the multiplication of the loaves, not to work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life. He raises their gaze above the earthly bread that their fathers consumed in the desert, telling them that it is the Father who gives the true bread from heaven. The first reading. Hardly had the Israelites departed from Egypt when they started complaining and murmuring. They barely completed the thanksgiving song of deliverance from Egypt when they lamented the lack of potable water in the desert. Just a chapter afterwards, in narrative time, they again complain of hunger in chapter 16 of the book of Exodus. They even desired the days of slavery. What lessons can we learn from the whole episode? Firstly, the sons of Israel remember the past, but they remembered in a wrong manner. While they remember the food they ate in Egypt, they failed to remember their divine deliverance from the land of slavery. They refused to remember that they ate Egyptian food as slaves and not as free people. Selective memory, dearly beloved, incurs ingratitude, and ingratitude leads to sin. As Christians, what do we remember? Or rather, what do we choose to remember? Do we only remember the wrong that people do to us while we skip the memory of the many benefits we have received from others, even unworthily? Do we only remember what we lack and fail to thank God for what we have? Do we regularly remember the goodness of the Lord in our lives? A second lesson. The Lord hears his people. Though the complaint of the sons of Israel was a product of selective memory, yet it did not fall on deaf ears. God still decided to listen to the Israelites and provide for them. Sometimes in life, we may feel that God is far away, that he neither sees nor hears us. When we are tempted to think like this, let us remember Christ on the cross. In that hour of great suffering and tremendous desolation, the Father remained by his side. 
His mother never abandoned him. Emmanuel, God with us, so close to us. A third lesson is this, God provides for his people. Indeed, as it remains a mystery how the birds of the air always get food to eat and the plants get nourishment, so also is it a mystery how many survive harsh economic conditions and even belligerent war situations. God provides for his people. If only we can learn to trust him and trust him with all our hearts. A fourth lesson. Herding is a sin. Keeping things to oneself is evil. God told Moses that the people should go out each day and gather some manner, but just a daily portion, that which would last for a single day. They were not to herd nor be greedy. By so doing, there was enough for all who wanted to eat. There is often hunger in our world simply because people refuse to share. A fifth lesson, life is more than food. Even though God satisfied the physical hunger of the Israelites in the wilderness of sin, their conception of the manna was gradually raised beyond its physical limits. They had difficulty describing precisely what the food was because it was nothing similar to what they previously knew. It was said to be as white as snow, and yet it tasted like honey. It was like the coriander seed, and yet it melted at the rising of the sun. In their perplexity, they say, man who? That is, what is this? By verse 20, the meal was rightly identified as bread from heaven, that is, God's gift. And by Psalm 78 in the Old Testament, it would be called the food of angels. Of course, Jesus completes the cycle when he says, I am the bread of life in the gospel passage. The experience taught the Israelites to look up to God and depend on him. Even in the desert, an arid land, only God can satisfy the desires of the human heart. In the second reading from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 and verse 20 to 24, Paul instructs the Ephesians on how to live as Christians. Their lives are radically different from the lives of non-Christians. The Church of Ephesus, a coastal city in Asia Minor, in present-day Turkey, comprised both former Jews and former Gentiles. Paul writes to encourage them to remain unified in Christ, since, unlike other religions welcomed in the city, Christianity was not welcomed because it was seen as a threat to Artemis, which is the most prominent religion there. Since his audience in Ephesus were majorly Gentile converts, he appealed to them to leave their former ways of life and embrace their new life in Christ Jesus. He says, you should no longer live as Gentiles do. The question here is, how do the Gentiles live? Paul says they live in the futility of their thinking. While the Gentiles were known for pursuing knowledge through logic and rationalization, they often fell into the trap of futile thinking and doubt. Even in their newfound Christian lives, they struggled with intellectual pride, rationalizing and making excuses for moral ills and for sinful actions. Paul's reminder of their radical transformation from these old ways to a new life of knowledge founded, founded on faith in Christ is a powerful testament to the transformative power of faith. He reassures them that they have been taught the truth in Christ Jesus, who calls them to put away their old self. This old self is a life without Christ, a life enslaved to sin, bound to the world, without hope, and filled with doubts about the truth of the scriptures. Therefore, as the Ephesians are to transition from their old ways of futile thinking to a new life of faith in Christ, Christians today are also called to live a life of faith in Christ who has made himself present to us in the Holy Eucharist. 
This call is especially important at a time when those with radical ideologies are desecrating the core of our Christian and Catholic faith as seen in the mockery of the Lord's Supper at the recent Olympic competition in Paris. In the face of such opposition, Christians must stand united with one voice and heart, defending our faith with fearless devotion to Christ in the Eucharist, as was demonstrated at the National Eucharistic Congress processions in the United States. The futility of thinking and, rationalize and rationalization of such evil should never be found among us. Rather, we are to live a life of faith and trust in the truth of Christ in the Blessed Eucharist. The Gospel is taken from John chapter 6, verses 24 to 35. It is a continuation of last Sunday's Gospel. After Jesus fed the multitude, they wanted to make him king over them, but he escaped. The people, however, were relentless. They went looking for Jesus until they found him in Capernaum. It may seem a good thing that they were looking for Jesus. Sadly, they were not interested in Jesus, but in the food they ate. Understanding how they were thinking, Jesus drew their attention to what really matters by making a contrast between earthly food and heavenly food. Earthly food is perishable and Jesus admonishes them not to strive for that. Their strive should be for imperishable food which the Son of Man will give. The imperishable and eternal food is Jesus Christ himself. As he tells us, I am the bread of life. We remember vividly that the perishable food they ate as we read last Sunday was multiplied by Jesus. So, the two kinds of food, perishable and imperishable, are given by Jesus. The perishable food has already been given to all humanity. The imperishable food, however, will be given only to those who believe in the one the Father has sent. The imperishable food is Jesus himself, the true bread from heaven. Jesus Christ specifies that this food gives life to the world. Therefore, the invitation to participate in the food that gives eternal life is to the whole world. Jesus says, He who comes to me will never be hungry. He who believes in me will never thirst. The Devar Adonai team thanks you for listening and may Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. To follow our reflections for Sundays and solemnities, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or follow our Facebook page, Devar Adonai, or visit our website, devaradonai.org.